out all day. Andy Thomas, of course, lives in Lewis. We had the MP Norman Baker, who uh, represents Lewis. And uh, our next speaker actually was the founder of the Montessori School in Lewis, according to the programme, which I hope was correct. <laughs> Goodo. Uh, Philip is uh, trained as a psychologist. And one of the uh, biggest things, he's a very familiar in Glastonbury, actually, because he uh, is the leader of OBOD, which is the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. And of course, he's studied Druidry for many years and takes a great interest in religion and spirituality. Uh, we don't actually know what he's going to talk about because we got it wrong on the website. So isn't that great? We've got a free session. So ladies and gentlemen, will you please put your hands together and welcome Philip Cargom. Hmm. Well, hello, thank you. It's lovely to be here. Um, I, I'm the conspiracy theory, I suppose, that I, I'm not... I'm getting, I have to make a confession right at the beginning. That's a good way to start. Isn't it? I'm not very much interested in conspiracy theories. Uh, in, of, of an external kind. I'm interested in the conspiracy theory um, that I think Alan Watts talked about in the 60s called the conspiracy against knowing who you are. And when I read that, it immediately struck a chord in me, being uh, interested in psychology and then studying religions and so on. I saw how our core identity is kind of layered with beliefs, conditioning, uh, uh, that has been laid down by experiences in parenting and is genetically imprinted. If you believe in previous lives, then perhaps it's come from previous lives as well. But the, the whole journey through life from this perspective could be characterized one of freeing oneself of these false conceptions about ourselves and the world. And that's not to say that I discount the value of conspiracy theories, and in fact, I've, at another level, I find them very interesting. The thing that always worries me about it, and I'll just say this one thing, uh, with, the, with the last uh, session, that uh, there were many things that I would agree with, but one of the things that surprises me about that is the inherent fallacy of, on the one hand, talking about uh, how odd it is that we believe everything we read in the papers, and that yet so much of the evidence comes from papers like the Daily Mail and so on, and The Sun, uh, which uh, we've been told it's naive to believe in. But that's another question. That's a question for debate. And I think the interesting thing when you study history in particular, and indeed any academic discipline, is the looking at the sources and where stories come from is so important. But of course, what we do see is in the manipulation that we experience through the media is we see, in a sense, the bardic arts, the art of the, the druid, the bard, uh, who knew the power of stories. If you know the power of stories, you can influence people and affect people. And my sense of what magic is about, really, is about learning how to work with the power of story in a way that enlightens, empowers, entertains, educates. And what we see in the gutter press is the power of story being used to induce fear and to manipulate people. And um, what... Um, so, so in becoming interested in, interested in, in uh, psychology and religion, um, I... Uh, when Andy asked me to give a talk here, um, I, I described it as follows, and I'm going to read it out because um, something has happened. There's a sort of, you know that Babelfish translator? Have you ever tried that thing of typing in some text and then typing it, changing it into another language like German or French? And then when you get the, the text, pop it back through the machine and translate it back into English, and you get this wonderful distortion. It's great, great fun to do one evening. And um, I think that's happened with my talk, because um, my description was beyond belief. Uh, in this talk, I'll address the fact that many people now don't want to be restricted by an allegiance to one religion, and yet are still searching for a meaningful and spiritual life. If we are inspired by the words of the Buddha and the Sufi mystics, and yet are also drawn to the beauty of Celtic spirituality, for example, are we just New Age dilettantes who are not disciplined enough to follow one path, or are we responding to a new call towards a deeper way that transcends the artificial divisions of creed and dogma and that frees the spirit beyond belief? 
And somehow, through the great Babelfish translator, it came out as what Philip, one of the UK's leading druids and author of the stunning new book on sacred places. Philip will be looking at how a return to ancient folklore and a renewed knowledge of sacred plants and their spiritual benefits could help balance the effects of the current world crisis. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if that was true and we could find a plant? I suppose there are some people who would say that, that there is a plant that can do that. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we could, we could uh, find that? Um, but it was Heraclitus who said that a great harmony is created when two apparently disparate things are brought together. And uh, in thinking of that, I thought, OK, well, I'll take those two very different descriptions and somehow put them together and see uh, if I can present to you with, with something uh, worthwhile. Heraclitus was called Heraclitus the Obscure. And uh, one of the things he said was, the world is filled with a great desire for life and a great dissatisfaction in living. And I thought, that isn't obscure at all. That's, I recognize that very much. Um, but what, what I want to suggest to you, really, is that I think something is happening in the world, and we're at a very interesting time, where, on the one hand, there's a retrenchment of people who are concerned by the sort of chaos they're experiencing. They're getting retrenched in fundamentalist positions religiously. So they're becoming fundamentalist Christians, fundamentalist Muslims, and so on. But there's another group of people, and I suspect most of us are amongst that, who are kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum, who are still interested in the meaning of life, still interested in why we're here, all the big questions, who am I, why am I here, what am I doing, and so on, uh, and, but are not willing to confine themselves to one box marked Christian, Buddhist, um, Hindu, etc. And one of the reasons why we're not doing that is partly because of the information explosion, partly because of globalism. And historically, we're at a time where we can feed ourselves and nourish ourselves with information from all across the planet, from many different cultures. And so just as the way we might be wearing clothes that come from all sorts of different parts of the world, and we might enjoy food from different parts of the world and enjoy combining them, or our music, for instance, we might enjoy combining, as in world music, for example. So the same thing is happening at the level of religions and spirituality. People are saying, for instance, you know, I, I know that the body is sacred. I want to move my body. I want to exercise in a spiritual way, if you like. Uh, I can't find any exercises in Druidism or Christianity. But the East can offer me Tai Chi and yoga and Qigong and all the rest of it, so I'll do some of that. Although I don't want to go to church on Sundays, Whenever I listen to Bach, uh, St. Matthew's Passion, I find myself floating heavenward. I want to do that. I'm inspired by Christian art or music. I love the poetry of Rumi and so on and so on. So this is the question. So what's going on? It's as if, as if we are becoming citizens of the world. And I think it's a very, very healthy phenomenon. The downside and, downside and the criticism of it is that it's uh, New Age dilettantism and it's the smorgasbord approach to religion. So this criticism usually comes from theologians who are uh, occupying one stall, uh, offering one kind of food, and then are surprised that people are sampling a little bit of Indian food and a little, little bit of Chinese food and all the rest of it. And of course, you can get, make a great mess. Anybody who knows about cooking knows that if you throw them all together, it can be ghastly. You know, uh, my son thinks that he can make pasta with uh, curry sauce as well, but you can't. Um, so you do have to be careful about what you're combining. But there's something else, I think, that's going on as well, which is what I would entitle um, the return of magic. Because at the same time as many of us are becoming open-minded and are feeding ourselves spiritually and intellectually from many different streams, so at the same time, people are becoming interested in magic. And there are more people practicing magic in the world today than at any other time. Now, on the one hand, one might say this is an incredible kind of retreat into irrationalism. And this is a symptom of the madness of the world that, that people are doing this. But I think something uh, else more interesting is going on. And I'm going to, I think one can connect the two phenomena together. There's a chap called Gareth Knight who's written a book called um, A History of White Magic. And in that book, uh, he refers 
to the relationship between magic and science and magic and religion. And I will just quote it to you. The world of magic is one of high imagination and an art and science with applications as universal as those of mathematics. Yet its unique scope, encompassing both science and religion, has caused it to be denigrated in modern times. Physical science has discarded it as superstition or as pseudo-religion. Religion has regarded it as it once regarded science with deep suspicion, thinking it to be an impious attempt to trespass on sacred preserves. But I consider magic to be a middle ground between science and religion, reconciling them in a technology of the imagination which can bring about personal regeneration and spiritual fulfillment. We have sadly neglected the contribution that the higher imagination can make in bringing about an ecological responsibility to science and a restoration of nerve to religion. Now that we and the environment are threatened with a Faustian disaster, could a reappraisal of the function and importance of magic be the key to our survival? And so he brings that into focus. And there's a way in which... In the old days, in the very beginning, magic and religion were combined. Magic, if you like, is the experience we have of when something emerges into life from the darkness, from the unknown. So I believe that the earliest experiences of magic were the experience of seeing the sunrise, the experience of seeing stars appearing in the night sky, the appearance of, uh, of a baby emerging out of the darkness of the womb. And we know that the earliest magical rituals were when people went down into the caves, undertook ceremonies, and then emerged at dawn uh, to be reborn. So powerful was this primal experience that, of course, when uh, places like New Grange in Ireland were built, they were oriented to the winter solstice sunrise, for instance. So when the year was reborn, the sun was reborn, they were enabled enable to enact this process of, of birth and of rebirth. And so this experience of light emerging from darkness, of the known emerging from the unknown, is essentially the magical experience. And we say ourselves, when we see something, when something suddenly appears, we go, oh, that's magic. And of course, that's where you get the connection with stage magic, when the, the white rabbit is brought out of the hat, as if by magic. And to begin with, the magicians and the priests were the same person because it was those sort of people who seemed to have uh, a connection with the divine, with the spirit world, with the other world, and therefore they were treated by the people in their tribes around them as being special in some way, and they fulfilled both functions. Interestingly enough, they fulfilled other functions as well, and this is why I think we're having a return of magic now. Because what happened was at a certain stage, as religion became codified and dogmatized, then magicians became a threat to the status quo because as well as being priests, they were scientists. Magicians were people who were always interested in things. They were, of course, the alchemists. They were the early chemists. They were always interested in mathematics and the power of numbers and all the rest of it. So you had this process of religion becoming increasingly codified to the point at which they didn't want people saying, hang on a minute, but I've just done this and it doesn't quite fit in and maybe it would be better to do it this way and so on. So you had this separation occurring. You then had a separation a little later on of science and magic when the scientific method was developed and the more irrational elements of magic and superstitious magic elements of magic were seen for what they were and science was born in its modern sense and so on. But why is it now that so many people are interested in it? Is it just some kind of atavistic kind of impulse? Is it just the emergence of the irrational in this kind of crazy world that we live in? Or is there something deeper going on? Well, I think the key lies in looking at the figure of the magician herself or himself, what they actually represent, why they're so powerful and why we're so intrigued by magicians, why Gandalf and Harry Potter and all these people have such kind of charm and interest for us. The reason why is because the magician operates in the worlds of religion, politics, 
science, medicine, and the arts. Virtually every domain, there is a m magical component, or the magician as an archetypal figure can operate. And the most interesting uh, and historically important magicians happened to have straddled a number of these spheres. And in this era, when divisions between disciplines are breaking down, when the interdisciplinary studies are becoming more and more important and we're starting to see the connection between things, so in the same way, I think, our interest in magic is being stimulated by that. So let me just take you back in time. One of the things, I've just finished working on a book called The Book of English Magic, because as I was studying this, I discovered the fact that England has the richest history of magical law in all the world. It just happens to be that way. If you said to me, look, I've got unlimited funds and plenty of time, I want to do a PhD in magic, where can I go? I wouldn't say go to Paris or Rome or New York or Cairo. I'd say come to England and probably start off in London, spend a good deal of time in London and also spend some time in Glastonbury and a few other places as well. And the reason for that is historical. It's to do with the dominance of the English language. Uh, there may be other reasons as well. Uh, when I mentioned this at a talk, somebody said, yes, it's because of the ley lines and the energy frequencies and all the rest of it. It could be that. It could be something far more mundane, like uh, the story of the British Empire and, and Britain's tradition of eccentricity and scholarship and so on. But for whatever reason, we do have this incredibly rich heritage. And if we look at, if I talk to you now about these different realms that magic works in, and give you a, just a, a, an example or two from that, from English magic. If you look at the realm of religion, first of all, why are uh, magicians working in the realm of religion? Well, for the reasons that I stated, that they seem to have, or the suggestion is they have a connection with the spirit world, the other world. England's most famous magician was a man called John Dee, who was Queen Elizabeth's astrologer. And he's famous for uh, his project to uh, communicate with the angels. And if you go to the Enlightenment galleries of the British Museum, you'll find this wonderful exhibit in the middle in a glass case of John Dee's obsidian mirror and the crystal ball that he used uh, to, in conjunction with his colleague Edward Kelly to communicate with spirits and angels and archangels. And he got all sorts of messages and so on. And he... Uh, was probably England's greatest magician, I would say. He, for instance, was asked to cast the horoscope for Queen Elizabeth I to determine the most auspicious time for the coronation. And he was a man who operated not only in this sphere of working with spirits. And as we go through each sphere, you can see how this still operates because, of course, we go to mediums. There are people who today who say that they're in touch with spirits and can be in contact with them. And so there are people still practicing. And there's a whole strain of Enochian magic where people uh, work with the magical system that Dee and Kelly developed. And Dee was powerful because not only did he work in that realm, but he also worked in the realm of politics. I say, what has magic got to do with politics? Nothing at all. Well, the stories of the ancient Druids go that uh, no tribal chieftain would speak until he'd consulted his Druid. The Druid was the advisor, was the Mandelson in the shadows, if you like, who was whispering in the ear of the king or queen. And... Uh, uh, the famous story of Boudicca, for instance, where uh, she was about to attack, I've forgotten which battle it was, I think it was London, before she attacked London, but uh, her, her, she, she play, pe prayed to the goddess Andraste, the goddess of war, and then asked her druid, uh, consulted him, and he said, let's seek an omen, and he released a hare from his cloak. And the idea was that if the hare ran to the left, it would be a disaster, if the hare ran to the right, it would be victory, and the hare duly rushed off to the right, and everyone went, hooray, like that, and they raised London to the ground. And uh, this idea of the Eminos Gris, the hidden power in the background, advising the ruler is a very powerful one that we see continuing to today. I mean, you remember, for instance, the story of Nancy Reagan, or, and I think Ronald as well, with um, the astrologer, when they discovered that uh, Nancy was consulting an astrologer. And um, interestingly enough, I read as well that they, when they moved into one of their houses, the, the address on the house was 666, 
and uh, he asked for the number to be changed, so it was changed to a, to a different number. And then the, the, the book I was reading said that, what was his name? Ronald somebody Reagan, like that, and they're all six letters. So his name actually has three sets of six letters, you know. So, so he, but he didn't worry about that. So, um, so even today, and of course you had, what was the story with Cherie Blair and her New Age advisor, I can't remember. Usually, notice how it works through the women now. The men are too well sort of protected for these stories to be associated. Um, and, and of course Hillary Clinton as well. Do you remember the wonderful transpersonal psychologist, um, Jean Houston, who has a particular exercise. And this, this is why, you know, using the gutter press as a sort of source of reference is, is so dubious. You know, what happened there was Jean Houston has a lovely exercise where she says, if you're confronted with a problem, imagine you have a sort of board of advisors, of people who you really admire, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, the Buddha, Jesus, whoever, you know, and then imagine, and then talk to them and say, look, I've got this terrible problem, what do you advise me to do? And if you ever try it, you'll find it's extraordinarily effective sometimes that you do get... Now, where the advice is coming from is, you know, this could... Be, who knows where it's coming from? But they got hold of it, and, and Jean Houston was a friend of Hillary Clinton, and so suddenly it was, um, it, you know, a guru advising Hillary Clinton to talk to the dead. So the president's wife was talking to the dead, and I, I met Jean Houston shortly afterwards. We did a little thing together in Avebury, and she was devastated because from that moment, of course, she had absolutely no contact with the White House talk, couldn't talk to them because of that. So, um, so you see how these old ideas still exist in the present day. They're just in a sort of slightly different form. The, the magician or the spiritual advisor to the ruler. So D was doing that as well. He was, it was his idea, I believe, he came up with the first idea of the British Empire. He actually wrote a, uh, an essay on it and it was his idea. So he was straddling both those worlds. But he, and he also worked in the realm of science. He was fascinated by mathematics, as many magicians uh, are and were. And so he, he worked uh, in the field of mathematics. And uh, if you look at the world of science, one of the reasons why I believe as well that there's a return of an interest in magic is that magic combines a scientific approach with a religious approach. Um, at the end of the last talk, Ian, the speaker, was talking about how we need both this sort of spiritual approach and a mundane uh, reality-based approach as well. And this is what the magician does. The magician has a fundamentally spiritual relationship with themselves and the world and reality. But they also are interested in how the universe works and are more interested in truth than in adhering to dogma. And so the early magicians were scientists. And so when they did their chemical and alchemical experiments, they were also praying, but they were also manipulating matter in order to determine results and effects and so on. And there was a wonderful magician in London, Robert Flood, who had learned the art of spagyrics from uh, Paracelsian uh, alchemy. And Paracelsus was a Swiss uh, physician who said, I'm not interested in alchemy in order to get physical gold. I'm interested in the gold of medicine that can heal and that can prolong life. And so he devoted himself to applying the magical and alchemical understanding to working with plants and metals and even animal products in order to create medicines. So he was a sort of founding father of, of modern medicine in some ways. But he applied alchemical principles to it. And he developed a, 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 a method called spagyric medicine, uh, which, and, which, which still exists today. There are people, there are alchemists today in England who are bubbling uh, mixtures together and making spagyric medicine. Um, and um, Robert Flood in London, uh, at the time of the plague, uh, he stayed, he helped to cure people. Um, here there was Simon Foreman as well. There all these, so there were magicians who were working in the field of medicine. And now at the cutting edge of medicine, if you look at some of the latest placebo research and uh, the work of, I think we should be very proud of the fact that in Britain we have um, another Louisian actually, who is the uh, professor, the fir Britain's first professor of complementary medicine uh, at the University of Westminster. And um, some of the work that's being done now is exploring this interface between the mind and the body, this area that is indeed magical. And so we have, as well, 
the area of the arts. And the area of the arts is an area that I'm particularly interested in because in the Druid tradition, uh, which is the you know, indigenous spiritual tradition of these islands, it's a tradition that places great store on the arts and the value of the arts. And it works with the understanding that there's a way in which the other world contains, is filled with an energy that we call awen, or inspiration, that flows into this, this world too. And that by working in specific and magical, if you like, ways, we can attract more awen into our lives and be more creative in our lives. It's based upon the understanding that creativity doesn't just come from our own personal subconscious that it can indeed come from that place, and we can sometimes recognize when we're being creative the particular elements that have made up that new uh, theory we've had or uh, painting we've painted or whatever. But there's also a belief in Druidry, as in any spiritual tradition really, is that there's a source beyond our own personal subconscious which is filled with creative energy, and that if we open ourselves to that, that can flow through us. And um, it was Tchaikovsky who said we should at least go halfway to meet inspiration. And so uh, spiritual practices, magical practices, when they're working in the realm of the arts, suggest that if we work on ourselves in a magical way, we can perhaps be more creative. A uh, good example of, of somebody who worked in both magic and the creative arts is, of course, W.B. Yeats, who was a member of the Golden Dawn uh, magical order and uh, was a great poet, of course. So we can see now how the magician as a figure is peculiarly contemporary, peculiarly needed an apposite to the time we're finding ourselves in now, where one particular religion or box can't hold us because we have tasted the fruit of forbidden knowledge, because we've been on to Google and we've found out things that we couldn't find anywhere else about some other religion. And we've realized that spirituality and the spiritual life is like a great river, and that every religion is fed by a number of tributaries. That it's not totally hermetically sealed and self-contained, but it's made up of a number of inspirations and tributaries. And we ourselves are like that. And we can feed uh, from all these different tributaries, which are in fact part of the whole ecosystem. So this requires a kind of reorientation, because to begin with, of course, we can get lost and feel disoriented and want the safety of one particular faith or one particular set of dogma. But if we can open to the beauty of this, to the fact that we're on this one planet with this fantastic heritage of uh, spiritual and scientific understanding of knowledge, then we can shed some of those layers of conditioning that have forced us into the narrow paths that perhaps our minds have traveled down and start to really uh, grow and change. When am I supposed to stop? <laughs> I don't know how long that's been. Sorry? 20 minutes, fantastic. Okay, um, so where were we? So yes, it, particularly apposite to today, because what we need now is it would be foolish to turn our backs on science because of the huge strides, the immense amount of knowledge and help that it's been in the world. But I believe it's also foolish to turn our back on the inspiration, the comfort, the nourishment, the insight, the philosophical depth that has been developed by the world's great religions and by the world's small religions too, and by spiritual paths in general. And it's as if magic offers us some way of working in that sense. If you look at, uh, if you look at say, one stream of magic, say the alchemical tradition, you discover that being an alchemist, you can be a Christian alchemist, you can be a, uh, a Sufi alchemist, there are Jain alchemists, Hindu alchemists, Buddhist alchemists. Alchemy runs like a kind of hidden seam, but behind every religion. It's a brotherhood and a sisterhood of understanding that transcends the dogmatic barriers. 
So alchemists can commune with each other and talk with each other as magicians can, if you're using that terminology. Magicians aren't worried about the label that you're wearing. They're worried or interested in your depth of experience and understanding. And so perhaps magic is one term that we can use to help us negotiate in this great sea of knowing, to help steer us and, and empower us as well. Because one of the differences between following magic or the path of magic and following the path of religion is that magic is empowering. One of the differences and one of the reasons why it's separated from the world of um, dogmatic religions was because magic gets you involved. It's an active approach to the spiritual path. It's as if magic says, lets you into the kitchen and lets you play and explore with the materials. This is why it's scientific. I wonder what happens if we do this and so on. Whereas conventional religions tell, tend, uh, on, the whole, on the whole, not always, tend to, to, not, uh, to provide you with a meal. You tend to be in the restaurant rather, in the ki- rather than in the kitchen. But that's enough from me. Um, if, you've, if you have any thoughts or questions, let's use this time rather than it being a one-way process. Have I been talking complete nonsense? <laughs> Describe the three paths of Bard, Ovate, and Druid. Okay. When, when, I was, when I was young, I had the great fortune to, good fortune to meet a magician. I was, I was 11. My father taught history at a crammer. I don't think they exist anymore. Maybe they do. It's called a crammer, where they um, a sort of tutorial kind of establishment. And the principal of the crammers was the chief druid. Uh, and um, so I met him when I was 11. He was a family friend. He was like this kind of uncle figure to me. And um, so from an early age, I was introduced to the world of the druids. And on the one hand... Uh, it seemed a strange world. You know, I was a teenager, it was the 60s and then in the 70s. Uh, everything was changing. The people who were doing Druidry then were mainly elderly people uh, and who would do ceremonies on Glastonbury Tour. I was initiated on Glastonbury Tour when I was 18. And, uh, and uh, there were about just a dozen elderly gentlemen and ladies and, who would forget the words of their ceremonies and have to have little sort of um, cue cards on their on string around their necks and so on. Um, so a part of me was thinking, what am I doing here? You know, uh, while all my friends were partying and going to pop concerts and things. But the th- thing that kept me going was this sense of the magical tradition of these lands. The fact that, you know, driving, you know when you drive uh, and you see Glastonbury Tour for the first time, and it's just wonderful, and then you learn the legends and the stories and all the rest of it. And so... The idea that we live in a magical landscape had always appealed to me immensely. And in 1969, you know, 1968 and 1969 were sort of hugely significant times. The amount of stuff that happened, you know, with, you know, assassinations and the riots and hair, the musical hair appearing and all all sorts of things that you can tie together and see a massive sea change was occurring in in the culture. And in 1969, John Lennon um, wrote a song called Mind Games in which he talked about some kind of druid dude. Uh, so it's something like druid, you know, part, parting the veil. Um, da, 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 the search for the grail. Anyway, so if you listen to it, it's easy to miss it, because there's a lot of music going on as well. But he talks about uh, parting the veil. And in that same year, a sort of cult classic was born, uh, a, a View Over Atlantis by John Michel, who died recently. And John Michel wrote this book where he brought together the ideas of Alfred Watkins about ley lines that had been developed in the 20s and 30s with ideas of feng shui and geomancy and and dowsing and so on and and numerology and magic and brought them all together and presented us with this image of a magical landscape. And so there was this, and and, and this is why I think John Lennon, for instance, was so interested in There was this opening to the fact that we live in a magical landscape. And so... um, I, I joined the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, and um, in over the last, uh, that was 
40 years ago now. And over those 40 years, uh, I've explored all sorts of different paths and studied psychology and psychotherapy and so on. And, but I've always come back to it. It's always acted as a kind of base and foundation for me. Because the three, the three aspects of the Bards, I've eight centuries, the Bards are people who work with the power of the word and of song, of music, of dance, of the arts, and of memory. And they're the storytellers and the artists. And the fact that here was a spiritual group and a kind of magical philosophy that embraced the concept of creativity and encouraged it and had all sorts of ways and techniques to do that, to me seemed incredibly exciting. And as I started to learn the old stories and the mythology of these lands and so on, um, it helped uh, me to feel at home in the world and at home in my country. And the Ovates are the group of Druids who are interested in the power of the trees, of plants, of the natural world, of stones, of rocks, of earth energies, and also of the particularly elastic nature of time. So the Ovates are concerned with divination and with oracles, with this idea not that you should or that you can read the future, like tuning in some kind of radio set that tells you what's going to happen next year, but instead that our particular construction of the passage of time is limited by our brains and, and the way we've been brought up and so on. And that in fact, there's a way in which the currents moving beneath linear time can be perceived through divination and so on. And so over the years, I've worked with this a lot, and together with my wife Stephanie, we produced the Druid Plant Oracle, which is where the idea of plants being of value came uh, in the talk description there, uh, the Druid Animal Oracle and the Druid Craft Tarot. Um, and so that's the province of the Ovates. And then the province of the Druids is the province of philosophy and teaching and working with the power of ritual and ceremony and with the rites of passage. Because one of the things... I realize too is that however much one may feel that one can do without religion or a spiritual way, when the times get really tough or when significant events occur like deaths or births or marriages, as human beings it seems to me that we need ritual. We need to mark special events in some way. And then the question comes, how do you do it? And again, I have to mention Lewis, because I suspect we are the only town in the country that has a ceremony shop. Uh, we have a little sh shop uh, where you can go and arrange an alternative funeral or wedding. or um, An idea I rather like is the idea of arrange having a funeral before you die. Have you heard of that one? It's so that you don't miss all the eulogies. <laughs> it's a bit spooky, but I mean, kind of, I wonder if anybody's done it. Um, so, yes, so that was the answer. Uh, I would like to hear you about crop circles. Do you think there are uh, magicals behind this? Ah, crop circles. Are crop circles magical? Do you, what, what, what do I think of crop circles? Do you know, I really don't know. All, all I know is that I was sitting outside the pub in Avebury one day uh, with a friend who lived around there. And I said to him, what do you think of this crop circle business? It was at the time there was a lot of publicity about, you know, the guys with the boards and the you know, rope and everything. And he said, he said, you know, I've seen hundreds and hundreds. In my opinion, the, 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 uh, there are two kinds of crop circles. There are the fake ones and then there are the real ones. And he said, look, I'll take you to them. And we went and visited two. And there was one. And he said, look, this is obviously a hoax. And there was, there was just a, it, it was um, fluffy around the edges, you know, and it was, and then he, he drove me to another one, and it was just crisp, it had been punched out of the, it was just un, unbelievable, really. And um, that's all I know. Um, I remember talking to John Michel, uh, we interviewed, when, when, we, when we did this book, when we did the Book of English Magic, when, when I sort of realized this incredible heritage that we have, um, uh, together with a friend, Richard Haygate, we decided to do a study on it. And it's a study that traces the story of magic from the sort of year dot right through to the contemporary period. And then gives you little, it's history, but then it also gives you little sort of experiments, if you like, to do, so you can taste what, you know, what this actually is or was. 
And then we also, then Richard interviewed over 50 people for the book, about 25 of them got into the book, um, of contemporary practitioners, because the odd thing about all this is that every kind of magic that's ever been practiced in England is still being practiced today, or is being practiced now. So take Anglo-Saxon magic. Well, Professor Brian Bates, a professor of psychology at Brighton University, is the sort of world expert on the Anglo-Saxon magic. Uh, Druidry, uh, again in Lewis, uh, is uh, the headquarters of uh, you know, the, the biggest Druid order in the world. Um, uh, what else have we got? All the different kinds of magic. And um, so we interviewed John Michel because he's such a key figure. And I, I said to him, uh, you know, what, what is the leading edge thing? What's the most important thing going on? You know, the people are interested in the feng shui and this and that. And, that. and he said, undoubtedly crop circles. And I said, why? And he said, because it provides us with mystery. And that... You know, our lives are spent continually trying to remove the very thing that gives life its sparkle. Uh, you know how when you fall in love, the exciting part is the mystery in it, that you don't know this person. And it's as if each of you are mysterious to each other, and in the mystery, love is born. And the reason why where science and religion meet and also divide, is in their relationship to the mystery. Where they meet, I think, and where one can find common ground, is the fact that religion works with the power of mystery. In the end, you don't know, and you kneel down and pray, or chant, or sing, or dance, or do whatever you do, or meditate, and soak yourself and enter into the mystery, and that uh, gives you nourishment. And science also kneels down in front of the mystery, but, uh, but it kind of tries to shoulder its way uh, through the door marked unknown. Uh, and that's its job, and that's absolutely fine. And um, the, both science and religion, I think, are, the, are at their most interesting when they're working in relation with, with the mystery. And uh, so crop circles, so John Michel's answer was crop circles because, you know, he'd been studying it for years and he didn't know, you know, and, uh, and, and that's why he loved it. Uh, so, so I don't know either. I don't, yeah. Yes. What does the practice of magic achieve? What does the practice of? Yes, yes. What what does the practice of magic achieve? That's a that's a very good point. Um, let me right at the back of the book. We've got a number of um, appendices. One of them is called on the importance of the armchair in the training of a magician. And, uh, and, then, and then there is a chapter, uh, there's an appendix called On the Uses of Enchantment. And I think the way I can best answer your question is just to quickly uh, read that to you because you'll see straight away uh, what, what the point is. In this book, we have surveyed the history of magic in England but of what possible use is magic in this modern age? A poet or artist might say it is supremely necessary to give inspiration to the soul. A psychologist or philosopher might say that magic can provide meaning in a world that can try us all at times. Like Hermes, who is both messenger of the god and patron of thieves, magic can be used to dazzle and seduce, to curse and summon demons, or it can be used to heal, to inspire, to acquire knowledge, and to effect personal transformation. Magic defies simple definition. For some, it offers a means for changing consciousness. For others, a way of accessing the spirit world. To others still, it offers ways of manipulating the circumstances of their lives or of opening themselves to a sense of awe and wonder. Though a concise definition may evade us, we can still list some of its most important uses for transforming the self, for discovering one's true purpose in life. There's more explanations, but I'll just buzz through it. For the development of supercognition or extrasensory perception, for enhancing normal cognitive functions, for achieving altered states of consciousness, for the development of virtues, for living longer, improving health, enduring hardship and pain, for engaging in scientific or Gnostic inquiry, for learning how to fly. Um, in, you know, out-of-body journeying and so on. 
um, for finding things that are hidden, for communicating at a distance, for time travel, for influencing events, for protection against misfortune, for inducing miracles, and so on. So it's got a lot of uses. <laughs> yes? Have you time traveled? Have I time traveled? Um, I think I have. <laughs> There's another question right at the back. Yeah. Are you trying to put us all into a box by calling us magicians? Absolutely not. No, I have no intention of labeling anybody in this room at all. What, what I did say, I think maybe what you were thinking of is, I said at the beginning that I think something interesting is happening, that generally, you know, and with all the problems that generalizations bring of, you know, and all the rest of it, but just very generally, that there's a, there's a certain retrenchment in, there's a large groups of people who are becoming fundamentalist and who are, sticking to their guns, if you like, sometimes literally, of course. And, but there's another kind of contrary movement of people who are be, becoming incredibly open-minded and are prepared to question things and are prepared to, uh, to draw their inspiration and knowledge from a number of different sources. And then I went on to link the idea of working in magic as being uh, similar and how that could perhaps be a helpful way of working in that way. But no, I didn't mean to label everybody here as a magician at all. Yes, and the other one there. Yeah. yeah. What, um, is there any role for some psychoactive plants in the history of this magic? Uh, and the uh, it's undoubtable that uh, throughout history and the evolution of shamanism and the into the practice of and basis of all religions, really, they seem to yeah. Okay, what the, the question was, what role would psychoactive plants play in the practice of magic? And, uh, you know, that there's been a long history of its use in shamanic traditions around the world and so on. Well, of course, when you look at the story of magic and the story of magic in England, what happened in um, the 20th century was uh, the, the chapter on that we've called Opening Pandora's Box. Because what happened is dead on cue in 1900, Sigmund Freud published his uh, On the Interpretation of Dreams. And as we moved into the 20th century, the idea of the unconscious and of the way the mechanisms of repression and so on work uh, became uh, more and more known. And at the, at a, in around, um, uh, you know, the sort of around the 1920s, I think it was, there was a chap called Alistair Crowley who came along and uh, decided to uh, use drugs and sex as ways in which to work magic and to, uh, to change consciousness. And um, what then, there's then a whole story. Now, opinions differ, as I'm sure you know, as to the uh, wisdom of that approach. And there are some people who are great fans of that approach, and you can trace the story of magic and the way in which drugs have been used in the story of magic from that moment onwards. And you can also trace the, uh, the story in which the value of drugs was believed to be, you know, that it, that it was believed to be harmful and drugs were not used. That's one thing. What I think you're pointing to is the historical component way back. And um, in, there was a theory, again in the 60s, surprise, surprise, when people started to use psychoactive drugs, people started to suggest that perhaps the druids were the guardians of the mushrooms. Somebody came up with the idea that cultures are mycophilic or micropho mycophobic. So they pointed to France and said, look, they're mycophilic because they go out with their little baskets and pick mushrooms uh, and, and eat them. Uh, in England, uh, we don't do that. And that's because the Druids were the guardians of the mushrooms, the two psychoactive mushrooms that grow here, uh, Amanita muscaria and then the, the Liberty Caps. And um, that the Druids would have put taboos and sanctions around them and only used them in their sacred work and so on. I happen to 
believe, uh, I, there's a very interesting book called Shroom by Dr. Andy Letcher, where he goes into this in great detail. And I think he makes a very good case for suggesting that this isn't the case and they weren't used. And that uh, the British uh, mycophobia says more about their cuisine and the way they relate to cooking and food and the French uh, in distinction than anything else. Um, but who knows? I don't know. So, any other questions? Yes, more at the back. There's a very fertile little cluster of you down there. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Most people are familiar with the concept of creating your own reality. That too is a form of magic. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. And you know that idea of you create your own reality. I think it's always important to include the corollary that we make each other's reality as well. Otherwise, we fall into the big New Age trap of solipsism, of where, where it becomes very selfish and it's all about, you know, you can get whatever you like and you can get what you want. You create your own reality and then, you know, to hell with everybody else is sort of implicit in that. Uh, the fact is we create each other's reality, which is where social responsibility comes in. And that's an, uh, an aspect that has tended to be put to one side in the growth of the New Age movement. And, you know, you can trace the development of that really through the development of psychology through, you know, from the beginning of the 20th century through. I think it's been a necessary phase uh, in, the, in the individual sort of growth process. You have to go through a phase where you start to look after number one because so many of us, you know, give ourselves away and all the rest of it. So a fairly familiar pattern in the individual sort of uh, cycle is that you, you have to go through a time of where you reclaim your own power and you say, go away to everybody and you reclaim your strength and all the rest of it. But I think there's a third phase to move into, which is, which is also being concerned about our social impact and so on. So, but I think you're right. Yes, you, uh, if you look at that whole uh, kind of uh, manifestation stuff and uh, you, know, you create your own reality, it's a fundamentally magical concept. And anybody who's worked with it and has experienced it knows that it does seem to be magical. It really is rather extraordinary the way it works. Four minutes. Four minutes. Right. Anybody else? Yes. What would you say is the point of ritual? What is the point of ritual? Yes. We are all artists, I believe, and we know now that our bodies and our energy field, that we have these wonderful energy fields. We know that there's more space in us than matter because there's you know, the gaps between the positrons and the neutrons are vast and all the rest of it, so that, 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 we, and that we are made up of energy frequencies and so on. We know that. When we come together, we form a, a, a field or a matrix. In this room now, if we all had sort of psychic vision or special vision, we would see a kind of sea of color. And if I suddenly scared you and some horrid picture of a monster came up on the screen there, one would be able to see a sort of change in the colors as everybody got upset and worried and all the rest of it. And then, and then if I made you all terribly happy by telling you that a you know, 50 pound note is waiting for each member of the audience as you leave, uh, suddenly you know, different lights would come on and so on. So we know that, we know that we're fields of energy. And that's why the field of complementary medicine is so interesting because it works with that uh, connection between mind and body. In ritual, when you come together, you come together with intention. And it's as if you're artists. So if we were all doing a ritual here together, or if we all did a meditation here together, uh, and we could introduce a little bit of ritual into it as well, like that, you would change the energy field. So the idea of a ritual is it has an intention, and you change the energy field. And in, in our Druid ceremonies, what we do is we, we, we all always do our rituals in circles because we're all equal. And in imitation of the, the circle of the circumference and of the earth and so on, and the sun and the moon, and we, we hold hands. And one, the first thing you notice as you start to do it is that if you, if you stand, a group of 20 of you, and you all stand like this, you feel a certain way, all hold hands and close your eyes, and you can immediately feel this sort of field that you've created. And then if you start to sing or engage in various ritual acts and so on, then it starts to change. So one way, I, I had quite a bit of difficulty with ritual because a lot of ritual can be empty 
and pompous and um, seems to be taking away from uh, the spiritual uh, sort of path in, in some ways. But I, I once ma asked my old uh, Druid teacher, and he said, ritual is poetry in the world of acts. And that says it all, I think. Poetry in the world of acts. So, on that note, I'd like to finish. Okay, thank you. Full of cardom. Thank you, Philip. <laughs>